is uh, we'll be in Titus chapter 1. Uh, Titus chapter 1. If you got your Bible there, Titus chapter 1. Timothy and Titus. Titus chapter number 1. We're going to continue on uh, part 2 and take a few minutes here. I don't know, I, I hope I can get it done rather quickly and uh, finish up the Halloween is from hell uh, part 2. And uh, just give you some more things here from the scriptures and from uh, this uh, hellish holiday and what it's, uh, what it's all about and how it has no business in the life of a Christian and uh, its history. Amen. Some of you, this may be old news. Some of, this, some of, these, some of these things tonight, you may, uh, you know, slap your forehead and say, oh, I already knew that. Why are we even talking about that? Well, there's some that don't know this. Amen. And so uh, we preach the whole counsel of God, and, and so we'll give, you, we'll give you what we've got here. All right, before we get started, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Lord, we come to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Titus chapter number 1. Um, now, I want to first start off by saying I want to give credit where credit is due. Most of this material that we're looking at and have been looking at is from Brother uh, Dr. Terry Watkins, a fellow Bible believer, and uh, uh, Brother James Melton, two, two Bible-believing men uh, who are very well read and they've studied diligently the, this subject. And I'm drawing heavily from their material and their stuff, and man, it's excellent. And uh, so in this study as well... I have a lot of quotes uh, that we'll be reading, and there's a lot of quotes uh, from lost people commenting uh, on the practices of Halloween and its origins and meanings. And this isn't, you say, well, why are you quoting from them? Why are you talking about them? Well, this isn't unbiblical uh, to do so. The Apostle Paul uh, did the same thing by quoting lost people who witnessed, um, who he witnessed and agreed with the truth uh, to learn from them. So there's lost people that uh, the Apostle Paul uh, watched and listened to and agreed with when they agreed with the truth and uh, he learned from them and so the first place we'll see that is in Titus chapter 1 uh, you say what are you doing preacher with this well I'm qualifying this because there'll be somebody out there uh, either in the church or online or somewhere and there'll be somebody out there to say say well why are you quoting those sources instead of just quoting the Bible well, I'll show you while we do that. Titus chapter 1 and verse number 12. There's nothing wrong with it. Titus chapter 1 and verse 12, the Bible says, uh, One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Uh, verse 13, Titus 1, 13. This witness is what? True. Amen? So when a lost person, can, uh, you can get some truth from them. It may not be God's word, uh, of course, but they, they witness to the truth. Amen? Then you can quote from them. You can tell them that. Uh, look at, uh, you're in Titus 1, look at Romans chapter 1. Back to your left to Romans chapter 1 in your Bible. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 14. Romans chapter 1 and verse number 14. The Bible says, here's the Apostle Paul, I am a what? A debtor. A debtor. He's, he owes a debt. He owes somebody something. Both to the Greeks, amen, and to the barbarians. Um, both to the wise and to the unwise. You say, what's Paul saying? What's the Apostle Paul saying? He said, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks. Uh, that's the sophisticated, that's the, uh, uh, the well-read, the, uh, the educated, if you will. And to the barbarians. That's somebody out there, uh, somebody that's a barbarian. is Maybe they don't speak, speak the same language as you, and uh, they, they seem a bit uh, primitive. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, I'm a debtor to both of them, uh, one, uh, both to the wise and to the unwise. And you say, what did he do? He learned from those uh, people, amen? And you do well to do the same thing. Everyone serves as an example. Some serve as a good example, and some as a bad example. Uh, and I ask you today, what kind of example are you setting, and what kind of example are you, a good one or a bad one, amen? And so continuing on in our, our study tonight, uh, we'll look uh, at Halloween uh, is from hell, part two, and we'll continue on talking about the different uh, 
parts of Halloween, and the, the one part, another part is trick or treat. That phrase and that uh, practice, and uh, it's it's another Druid-inspired custom. It's from the Druids. Uh, every year on Halloween, many children throughout the world dress up in costumes and go door to door in a ritual known as trick or treating. And uh, the reason that, that the history of that is from the Druids, it's from uh, Samhain and that, and you say, what did they do? They dressed up originally, and they tried to make themselves look like demons and devils and, and uh, ghosts and goblins and all of those things so that the real ones that had been released on that day, quote-unquote, um, ha- wouldn't recognize them and they would leave them alone, and thus they would be tricking them. And uh, the people that were there... Um, uh, in the houses, then to keep them appeased, they would offer them uh, a goodie, a treat, a baked good, something, and they would offer them a treat to leave them alone. So one of, on one side, there'd be people tricking them, and there'd be other people treating them, all to avoid and appease these, uh, uh, these uh, false deities and false um, uh, devils walking around, supposedly. And so it's all, of course, pagan. <clears throat> this is what Garena Dun- Dunwich said. And she wrote a book called The Pagan Book of Halloween. And she said, unaware that their innocent masquerade is actually the remnants of a druistic religious practice from times most ancient. So it originated with the Druids. Uh, Jack Santino said this, whatever the wrinkles, the root assumption is the same. Trick or treat had its beginning in the Celtic dawn. Comes Comes from that. And so... Continuing on with this trick-or-treating, the next part there is mask, and these are the different elements that are practiced. Mask and costumes. Um, Mask and costumes carry a long history in the occult and demon possession. Masks are contacts to the spirit world to invite the spirit to possess them. In rituals, a person wearing a mask of a god or a spirit feels possessed by the supernatural being. That's from the world book. Page, 2000, um, yeah, page 263 from 2005, World Book. Um, page, uh, page 263, two, 2005 was when that was put out. And so when you study um, the, the worship of false deities and pagan gods, what they would often do is they would put a, stat, uh, they would put a mask on of, of Zeus or um, you know, go on down the list of these false um, half-demigods and they would put the mask on. And uh, they would have their satanic rituals uh, and things of that nature. And, and you say, what were they doing? They were, they were using that as a symbol for that spirit or whatever they were wearing or whatever they were dressing up as, as an invitation to inhabit them. You can't make this stuff up. It's, it's spooky. It's scary. Uh, and so the, this is what um, Hans Biedermann said, Dictionary of Symbolism. He said this, the person wearing the mask feels internally transformed and takes on temporary, temporarily the qualities of a god or demon represented by the mask. I'm just telling you what the history of this stuff comes from. Uh, one of them is uh, a bat. Here's some different animals that people will dress up as. And, and uh, you've ever heard of Batman? Why is he so popular? All of this stuff is, is connected uh, uh, to, to the occult. And... Uh, I mean, you think about it. You want a superhero, and you're gonna you're gonna worship you're gonna, and you say, what do they do with those heroes? They're supposed to be godlike, and they represent uh, the, these things. And this bat is there, a Batman, Batman. Uh yeah. One of the animal shapes, a bat is one of the animal shapes commonly used by these demons or familiars, as they were often called was the bat. Bats and their blood were also used in casting of spells, especially those of black magic, the brewing of potions. And that's from uh, this this woman that wrote this is from the book of Pagan Halloween, uh, Gerwina Dunwich. Uh, if, if some of you will remember from time ago, times gone by, maybe you were lost and listening to, I hope you were anyway, lost when you were listening to Ozzy Osbourne. Um, but uh, he, you see, what happened with him? He became famous for biting the heads off bats in his satanic death metal rock concerts. And he'd take those bats and rip, rip, bite their heads off, and the blood goes in the gushing into the air, and the crowd goes wild. You say, why? It's satanic. Satanic. And you can go study on that and that unclean thing there. 
Um, but we won't get into all that tonight. Continuing on, another thing that's uh, synonymous with, with Halloween, and that is an owl. On Halloween night, um, this is Gerwina Dunwich again, an owl on Halloween night, demons uh, in the form of owls were said to have traveled with witches and their cats. Some were even believed to be witches in disguise, an owl, an owl. Interesting, interestingly enough, the owl is, was called a strix, S-T-R-I-X, by the Romans. It's called a strix, an owl was, uh, which means, guess what it means, a strix? It means witch. That's what, it, that's what that word strix means, and that's what the owl was called, a strix, which means witch. Um, you better watch those words that end in X. If you know what Dr. Ruckman has, has taught us, uh, uh, Romex connectors and um, the <laughs> X-Men and X-Box and Xerox, a carbon copy, that's what the devil tries to be, XXX, pornography, uh, four X's, alcohol, you can't get past it. It's something to it. Uh, and that, that comes from, uh, like I said, uh, the pagan book of Halloween. Continuing on, um, black cats were associated. Uh, black cats are uh, always out on Halloween, and uh, they're associated with darkness and death. Uh, they embodied, um, this is what Gilly, Ellen Rosemary Gilly said, the Encyclopedia of Witches and Witchcraft, page 49. Black cats are associated with darkness and death. They embody demons who performed the witches' task of malfeasia against their neighbors. Black cats are said to be the devil himself. This is what they're saying. This is what they're saying. And you say, what this cat? Um, you, you, you've, you've heard this before, I'm sure. But what's an alcoholic? Someone that's uh, an alcoholic, holy, H-O-L-I-C, holic. Uh, that's somebody that's holy, uh, completely. Uh, holistic is some, a whole thing. Uh, whole body, holistic uh, treatment. Uh, holy is someone that's completely given to alcohol, an alcoholic, somebody that's completely and wholly given to alcohol. Uh, well, what's a, a cataholic, a catholic, a catholic, cata cataholic? That's somebody that's wholly given to a cat, connected to the Roman Catholic Church. And you say, what are they going to do? They're going to give their uh, power, and they're, uh, they're going to go over there and follow that beast. Um, and that's mostly a cat, mostly a cat. You ever seen that sphinx? How about that? A cat with a man's head, uh, a cat body and a man's head. Uh, and that's called a sphinx, a sphinx, uh, a cat with a man's head. <laughs> Sounds like the Antichrist, doesn't it? That, that beast that comes together. Um, Amen. Now, another symbol that's in Halloween is a skull. The skull, that's an interesting symbol. Um, Masonic and occult symbols illustrated by Kathy Burns, page 388. She said that there, it's prominent in witchcraft and demon worship as a celebration of death. We've already covered that in Proverbs where it talks about all they that hate me love the ways of death. And it also, uh, if you see that skull and crossbone, it also represents poison. Poison. Uh, just, just saying. Now, Halloween is um, obscene as well. Uh, Halloween is obscene. And uh, Halloween is always wallowed in the obscene. Um, history is, uh, when you study about Halloween, and uh, you say, what's it connected with? Vandalism. People get out and they, they throw eggs at cars and houses and toilet paper, and, and they do all kinds of destruction and wickedness on, on Halloween. And uh, I remember growing up as a kid uh, and, going, uh, and going when I was lost. With my, my parents took me and I, I went and trick-or-treating and all of that. And um, there was razor blades found in apples. Uh, razor blades and syringes. They would, people would put it in there. And uh, you say, what was that evil? Uh, and they'd poison the candy. And you say, what was it? It's a clear testimony of the evils of Halloween. And every year, someone, several people are poisoned and die uh, from, from that going on as well. So much so, uh, during my time anyway, in the 80s, they, we would have to, they, they ran a service where you'd take your, your candy at the end of the night, and you'd go down to the local hospital, and they would x-ray the candy. 
to make sure that there were no razors or, uh, you know, straight razors in there that you'd cut your mouth on and, and be poisoned. So they would, they would x-ray it down at the, down at the local hospital. <laughs> so uh, Halloween's always been a night of perversion, and it continues to be so. And uh, it, it's, it's a, a night where rules are broken and, and um, people masquerade and, and everything else. And so Halloween's best kept secret is a romantic love affair with sodomites. Halloween was the golden key that unlocked the sodomites' closet of perversion. Uh, you say, what happened on Halloween? Uh, that's where people get to dress up as whatever they want to be. And they, they, um, they publicly flaunt their, their perversion, and it's an opportunity for them to act out their desires and fantasies that goes against social norms. And um, here's what uh, Roger, Rod, Nicholas Rogers said, Halloween, from pagan ritual to party night. He said, Halloween is unquestionably a night of perversion. And he's saying it in, the, in a good light, like it's a good thing. Sheena Morgan, The Real Halloween, page 42. Halloween has always been a night of misrule and outrageous. Uh, in recent years, it has been adopted by the sodomite community. Now, I'm replacing sodomite, but she, she'd call it something else, but the Bible believers call it a sodomite. And um, David Skull, um, Death Makes a Holiday, he wrote this in his book. The Halloween machine turns the world upside down. One's identity can be discarded with impunity. Men dress as women and vice versa. Authority and societal norms can be mocked and circumvented. Halloween has done more for the current acceptance of sodomy than any other event. Jack Santino wrote this in uh, Halloween and Festivals of Death and Life. For sodomites, Halloween is a moment of utopian wishfulness. I can't even remember in my school uh, during, during this time how many um, uh, men dressed up like women. And you know, the Bible is, a, is against that. Uh, you ought not wear men. The Bible says ought not wear that which pertaineth to a woman, and a woman ought not to wear that which pertaineth to a man. Uh, it's confusion. It's not right. Amen? God made us different. God made us different. But on Halloween, anything goes, you see? And you're talking about perversion and filth and, and wickedness that's sown into the, the hearts of people. It's done on ha Halloween. And, you know, the Bible says that uh, uh, moving on, Halloween's subtleties and the subtle things that's going on in ha Halloween. And here's really the warning to Christians. Um, already, um, YouTube cut the comments, but um, some fella wrote in uh, to the channel and uh, put, you know, three... Uh, three uh, <laughs> 3,000 word essay in there to correct me uh, on these things and his whole conclusion the whole matter was on the first lesson was this that um, you know all the stuff you've been teaching you're just you're just over imagining these things and it's it's a cutesy little sweet little holiday and there's nothing subtle in it it's just that just a time to dress up and have a good time and he completely ignored and, and, and did away with all of the connection to the Catholic Church and Sam Hain and all of those wicked rituals and where all this stuff, this stuff comes from. I guess he just thinks it came out of thin air. And, uh, but yeah, he, uh, <laughs> uh, he wrote in and, and tried to get us all straightened out on this. But we know as Bible believers that the Bible says that the devil is more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God hath made. And so while many deem Halloween as harmless and fun and fantasy, Halloween subtly, uh, subtly disarms, um, uh, and especially children, it disarms them. And you say, what does it disarm them of? It disar disarms them of a discernment of witches and the occult. Amen? Halloween's um, fun and fro uh, frolic transforms witches, demons, devils, and evil incarnate into just happy, fine, smiling, good old times. Did you know on, in Halloween, in America alone, in ha on Halloween, over, there is, um, in America, over 1.2 million practicing and proud witches that claim to be part of the, the Wiccan movement in America alone. Witchcraft currently is the fastest growing religion in America. How about that? And uh, at the same time, nearly every little girl becomes a witch on Halloween and transforms herself into that. 
and uh, at least one, one or, once or twice while growing up. And it's one of the most popular costumes and dress-ups that uh, girls want to attain to and do. And you say, what's the problem with that, preacher? Well, I already took you to Leviticus and showed you what the Bible said about witches and uh, what, what God said about witches, not just what the Bible said, but what God said about them. And uh, so the Lord doesn't take it as a light, uh, half-hearted, you know, chuckle. And, you know, like the Bible says, at these t times of ignorance, God winked at. God's not winking at it. It's sinful and it's wicked because it's disarming, disarming uh, the discernment of God's people and especially uh, young people and children. Today, um, this is what um, uh, Sil Halloween, um, this, this is uh, ri written by, wrote by a witch. Silver Raven Wolf, and she said, Halloween customs, recipes, and spells, and this is what she said. Today, just about every little girl in our society at one time or another has chosen a costume herself as a witch. If you choose a witch's costume this Halloween, hold your head up high. Wear your witch's garb proudly in their honor. That's what she said, a witch herself. Isn't that something? There was an occult historian uh, Jean Markel, uh, and he discloses, Jean, sorry, Jean Markel discloses Halloween, bids more than childish dress up. It's a pagan initi initiatory journey, guided by someone, he said. We know who that is, that's Satan, guided by Satan, hidden in the shadows, and none return from Halloween innocent. That's what he said. The passage into the world of Halloween is truly an initiatory journey. One does not return from it an innocent. But making the journey alone does not mean there was no guide, no initiator, someone who prompted the quest and who, sometimes hidden in the shadows, watches over the comings and goings of the Nephethite through his labyrinth that is the other world. That ought to put some um, chills down your spine. And that was by Jean Markell, The Pagan Mysteries of Halloween. Uh, Dr. David Enoch, former senior consultant psychiatrist at the Royal Liverpool Hospital in the UK and University of Liverpool, states this, Halloween's practices open the door to the occult and can introduce forces into people's lives that they do not understand and often cannot combat. And you wonder why the world's gone crazy and why people are full of the devil and doing what they do. They, they've been bred up from this stuff, and they say, oh, they only practice it once a year. Isn't that enough to invite a devil in uh, and, and embrace that occult? And the devil's cheering. Amen? And so I'll just close up by this, by giving you a bit of uh, admonition here on this, with this. We're, we're going to get into, I think we got a bit of time to, yeah, we still got a bit of time to get into Philippians, and we will. Um, but I, I say that to you, you've got a, a golden opportunity during this time uh, as how, uh, when Halloween's going on as Christians. You say, why? Well, the Bible says, as using this world, not abusing it. Amen? Halloween is a soul winner's dream. Rather than going to a wicked uh, rock concert or a Mardi Gras parade to witness or downtown Sydney, on Halloween they come to you. <laughs> Amen? On Halloween, lost children and lost parents come to your front door for a treat. Give them a real treat, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. As you hand them some candy, give them a gospel track. Amen? Uh, the, the, you say, what, the, the night of Halloween doesn't have to be a frightful night for Bible believers where we, uh, we go hide and close all the lights and hope nobody shows up. Uh, we're the light of the world. You say, what are you supposed to do? Uh, you're supposed to glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. Put a gospel sign up there when they walk up to the door. Let them read the scriptures. Amen. Get one out there. Brother Isa, he's always sending me ones he puts on the front door of his shop so that when people come in, they can read these gospel signs. And he just gets him a bit of uh, texture and uh, uh, cardboard paper and writes it up there. Amen. You don't have to even get it printed off. You can make something nice there, and uh, and, and of course there'll all be always be somebody, and and that's up that's up to them if they want to object to it. And some say, um, no, don't don't participate with it at all, and don't pass out gospel tracts because you're a partaker of their evil deeds. No, um, I say this: Satan is the god of this world. Amen. In two Corinthians chapter four, verse four, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. We live in this world, not just the one night of Halloween, but we still go out into this dark world and preach the gospel. Um, even days of the week are named after pagan gods. Amen? Moon day. That's Monday. Moon day. 
Um, Zeus Day, that's Tuesday, Zeus Day. Uh, Wooden, Wooden's Day, that's Wednesday. Thor, Thursday, Thor's Day. That's where this stuff comes from. Freya, Freya Day, that's Friday. Saturn Day, Saturday. Sun Day. Every day of the week is, is um, locked off for that. We live in this world, amen? You ever look at that, um, um, the, these, the different symbology all around the world? You couldn't go anywhere if you, if you made that uh, your rule, amen? I'm glad, though, as David took out his sword and cut off the head of Goliath. I mean, David took Goliath's own sword and he cut off his head, amen? He cut off his head with his own sword. So we can take one of Satan's swords and cut some souls off from hell. Amen. In Jude chapter 1 and verse 2, the Bible says, And others saved with fear, pulling them out of the fire. What a testimony that would be. How many times have I personally read testimonies of uh, uh, l listening into Jack Chick and, um, and seeing his ministry and how many times uh, uh, somebody's wrote into him and said, I got one of your gospel tracts on Halloween and I went home and read it or I left it for a couple of years in a drawer and I picked it up and I got that thing on Halloween and I got saved. Amen. What a, what a testimony that'd be. Uh, somebody here in Sydney gets saved to come into a Bible believer's house. You don't even have to go out and chase them. They're coming to you. And they may come to you. A hundred may come to you in one night. How about that? You ever thought about that? Amen. And you say, well, social distancing and, and all that. Just put them out there and, and put them, take, a, take a gospel track and just make it and wear gloves, do whatever, and make it clean and nice and, and, and put you a little string out there and hang them up uh, with a clothespin. Uh, so they can get them when they come to your front door, amen? And just put, put up there, please, please take one, uh, amen? You won't even have to look at them and see them if you're, you know, trembling and don't want to go see them, <laughs> amen. All right, I'll stop right there, and that'll end our, our uh, study on, on that, amen.